Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for this RT workshop brought to you by Astral Aviation Consulting on behalf of the UK Civil Aviation Authority. I'm in the West Midlands this evening and it's been a beautiful day for flying up here. Uh, it'd be great to find out where you're all based. So why don't you let us know via the chat box? OK, so while you're doing that, then, if you want to stay in the loop with safety events and resources, please do sign up to our mailing list. You can do this by going to our website, www.astralaviationconsulting.com or use the link that's just appeared or is about to appear in the chat box. Uh, signing up also gives you access to the replay of this workshop and a whole host of other safety resources. This evening, I'm once again joined by Matt Lane, Head of Training and an active single and multi-engine FI and FE, and also Nigel Wilson, who's also a Head of Training at an ATO and FI, FE, and a display pilot. And he also runs Easy PPL Ground School, which provides online courses for student pilots, licensed pilots, instructors and training organisations. Good evening to you both. Hello. Hi, good evening. Okay, doke. Over the course of the next hour, we're going to cover some general RT procedures, en route RT, aerodrome RT, and some top tips before finishing with a Q&A, which we'd love you to take part in. So please do, if you do have any questions, add them to the Q&A box as we go. Some of you will have realised, by what I've just said, that this workshop's loosely based on CAP 413. Whilst we can't cover everything in the CAP, what we have done this evening is picked out the more pertinent points for you, and we're going to discuss that as we go. Of course, if you do have time, it's well worth reminding yourself of what's in the CAP. The link to that will go in the chat box as well. Also, while we're talking about links, don't worry if you don't click on any of the links that come up throughout uh, the course of this presentation and this webinar. All the links we share this evening will go into a follow-up email, which will be sent to you once we finish. Uh, I'd just like to put in a little caveat here. Whilst this workshop is designed to discuss some tips, ideas, and thoughts around CAP 413, please remember that in all cases, you should follow the direction and guidance of your allocated examiner, along with your individual school procedures or orders. We've got two examiners on the call this evening, and I'm sure they would agree with that. Right then, so to kick us off, I'd just like to find out who's with us tonight. As always, if you're watching live, this poll will pop up on the screen. If you're watching on demand, you won't be able to interact, but please do test your knowledge with the polls as we go through. So then, let's have a little look. Who is with us? Can you let us know uh, via the poll, which will pop up on your screen now? Are you a PPL student, a license holder, a lapsed license holder, or other? So it's just get us a feel for who is in the room, in the virtual room, because um, we do like to put out our safety information to a broad range of, of different pilots uh, with different experience levels. So that's great. Thanks ever so much, Chloe. If you'd like to take the poll down, let's have a look at the results. Brilliant. So 15% PPL students, welcome. The license holders, 79%. That's brilliant. Good to see you guys here as well. A couple of lapses in there and a few others. So great. We've got a bit of a broad spectrum in, in the room tonight, which is great to see. Thank you very much. Right, that's quite enough from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Nigel, who's going to talk about general RT procedures. Over to you, Nigel. Okay, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so just before we get into detail, let's start with a quick question, shall we? And uh, just on the screen now, um, we'll give you a little time to digest it. I'll read it out while you read it, actually. So you're at the hold. Uh, and you receive the following clearance, uh, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta, runway 25, surface wind 270 degrees, 10 zero knots, cleared for takeoff. And what is your response? And uh, you've got them all down there. Runway 25, cleared for takeoff, followed by the call sign, or just cleared for departure, followed by the call sign. Cleared for takeoff with the wind 270 degrees, 10 zero knots, followed by the call sign, or just cleared for takeoff takeoff followed by the call sign so make a choice it's not going to be on there for very much longer uh, nothing like a bit of pressure <laughs> to start the evening and we'll see where we go with that okay just a couple of seconds there we go so you've all answered that so let's first of all see what the correct answer was was indeed runway 25 cleared for takeoff, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta. And as we can see there, uh, most of you have got it correct, 68% of you. And uh, basically anything uh, to do with numbers, basically, 
uh, that doesn't involve the weather, uh, you have to read back. And obviously the takeoff clearance, you also have to read back and your full call sign also because that's what ATC calls you. So you reply with your full call sign. Right. So a little bit about standard words and phrases then. So radio telephony provides the means by which pilots and ground personnel communicate and to ensure communications are clear and fully understood. It's vital that RT transmissions comply with internationally agreed procedures and phraseology. Don't forget English is an international standard within aviation. So all RT users in the UK are expected to comply with the phraseology in CAT 413. Uh, and this also now includes the UK military as well. So all radio or RT messages comprise uh, of one or more of the following elements. There's three things. They're either a clearance, they're either instructions, or they contain information. So a clearance requires strict compliance and any clearances must be read back verbatim. And you'll often find the controller will not let you go past go until you read it back. They will keep on at you until you do. Uh, instructions should be followed and carried out where it's practically possible and safe to do so. And in most cases, you read those back as well to reduce the chance of any ambiguity or misunderstanding. Roger and Wilco, we'll come back to that in a bit, can be used to acknowledge start, uh, sorry, short and unambiguous instructions where possible. Information is provided to assist the safe conduct of the flight and shouldn't be read back. And sometimes it's a little bit confusing as to what's information and what's an instruction. But again, you know, that comes with experience and practice. Used properly, the clearances, instructions and information transmitted will greatly assist in the safe and exp expeditious operation of the aircraft. So pilots should be aware that the elements of each transmission, uh, sorry, that the elements of each transmission ensure only those elements that are required to, re to be read back are transmitted. You shouldn't go over the top and be overly verbose uh, because that's a common RT pitfall. And we all know that when we're not, un we're sure, unsure of stuff to say, we tend to go into verbose mode. So try to avoid that and keep the transmission simple uh, and clear. The use of standard RT procedures and phraseology help avoid misunderstanding and reduce the need for repeat transmissions. And incidents and accidents have occurred in which contributing factors have been the misunderstanding caused by the use of non-standard phraseology and pilots not understanding the important elements of the message. So wherever possible, use standard phraseology and avoid those long-winded of those transmissions. A list of the standard phrases are in CAT 413, and it's well worth a quick refresh on those if you have time. For example, as part of your return to flying preparation, if you haven't been flying for a while. So let's have a look at some examples then of some clearances, instructions and information and acknowledgement then. So things like a clearance, so requiring a strict compliance and to be read back verbatim, such as, as we've you know, almost seen on that first slide, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta cleared to land. So that is a, a, a clearance and it has to be read back verbatim. Instructions uh, to be followed and carried out where practically possible and safe to do so. So, for example, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta taxi to the apron via taxiway Charlie. And again, for a non ambiguity, you would read that back verbatim. So, information then, Golf uh, Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta surface wind 240 degrees, 15 knots. So, that is something that you can just acknowledge by Roger, or if it was uh, asking you to report something, then you would uh, acknowledge it by Wilco, but we'll come back to that, as I said. So acknowledgements of information should be signified by use of the receiver's call sign, which is a, a shorthand, if you like, for Roger, so you can just reply with Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta, or you can use Roger. Um, you shouldn't say things like copy the weather or copy the traffic. That doesn't exist in CAT 413, nor in any of the international standards to do with RT. So let's have a quick look at transmitting technique then. So a few things here then. So before we transmit, we need to double check that 
you can hear what somebody's going to say back to you. So make sure you set the volume correctly on the radio. And if you don't know what the squelch, the radio squelch button is or where that is to help you do that, then ask somebody else or ask an instructor or another pilot to show you for your particular aircraft and radio. Second one, then, most important, listen out to make sure no one else is transmitting at the same time as you. And also, also make sure that you're not going to interrupt a conversation that's halfway through where you hear a controller say something to an aeroplane. Don't butt in. Let the aeroplane reply first before you then start what you're going to say. Third one, then, uh, this is uh, quite important. Only press the transmit button when you're ready to speak. Uh, we often call the little button the brain disconnect switch because uh, that's what tends to happen. So try and make sure you know what you're going to say before you press the button to speak. Um, avoid speaking too quickly as well. The, the standard rate for RT or the maximum rate for RT is actually 100 words per minute. And that's a lot slower than how I'm speaking now. This would be about 100 words per minute think about it is less than two words a second it's actually quite slow so number five there then uh release uh, or in fact number eight on <laughs> uh, number five there speak clearly okay um and distinctly and try to avoid using hesitation words such as er uh, or um and things like that that can get in the way of good understanding uh Number six on there, maintain the speaking volume at a constant level. Uh, most of us these days use headsets, so uh, we don't have to worry about holding the microphone a particular distance from our mouth. It's already there. But make sure it hasn't moved while you're moving your head around the cockpit, or if you're doing aerobatics, a lot of G can move the microphone boom under your chin. So uh, just be aware of those things. Um, try not to use excessive courtesies like pleases and thank yous. Uh, it gets in the way and it takes time and any controller is not going to thank you for doing all of the niceties if they are in a busy environment trying to speak to a lot of aircraft. So and finally, remember then to let go of the transmit switch after you have finished speaking, because uh, that also can cause obviously a problem because you're going to block the frequency for everybody else. So think and listen out before you press the transmit switch, keep the transmissions clear and concise, and remember to let go of the button once you've finished speaking. So let's have a look at uh, clearance issue and readback then. So uh, a clearance can vary in contact from a detailed description of the route and levels that you're going to be flown to a brief stand to a, to a brief standard instrument departure that's going to be very concise because it's already pre-planned. So controllers will usually pass a clearance slowly and clearly since the pilot needs to write it down, and they know that. And wherever possible, a route clearance, which is really to do with IFR flying, but a route clearance will be passed to an aircraft before startup and before um, before taxi. And in all or in most cases, usually with clearances, the full call sign will be used, even if you've been abbreviated beforehand. So just bear that in mind. So don't forget an ATC route clearance or a departure clearance is another word for that is not an instruction to take off or to enter an active runway. And the words take off are only ever used when an aircraft is cleared for takeoff or if the takeoff clearance is cancelled. At all other times, the word departure is used. And that comes from a really horrific accident uh, in Tenerife a few years, well, quite a few, quite a few years ago now, but that's where that change was made. ATC route clearances should always be read back unless otherwise authorised by the appropriate air traffic authority in which case they should be acknowledged in a positive manner. Readbacks shall always include the aircraft call sign. So if you look at the example on the screen, uh, we've got Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta after departure, cleared to the zone boundary via route echo, climb to altitude 2000 feet, QNH 1008, squawk 6522. That's quite a lot of information to write down, but you need to do it. 
And after the departure uh, cleared to the after departure cleared to the zone boundary via Rue Echo, climb to altitude 2,000 feet, QNH 1008, Squawk 6522, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta is your reply. Usually they'll come back and say if that was correct or not. And if you did get anything wrong or you missed something out, they would come back to you and give you the information you missed, asking you to repeat it or uh, as required as to what you need. So next one then, clearance issue and read back. Uh, the air traffic messages listed on the screen, which hopefully was going to come up in a minute, thank you very much, right, uh, are always to be read back in full by the pilot. I don't propose to go through all of those because, you know, if you look in CAT 413, they are all listed there. However, there is a very easy way to do some of that without having to know all of those individual things you have to read back and what you don't. And my little cheat I've got is that if it's got a number in it, you have to read it back unless that number is to do with the weather or traffic. And if it's a clearance or information, read it back anyway. So things like, you know, service wind or traffic for you, you don't have to repeat that. You can just acknowledge that with Roger. So if an aircraft read um, if an aircraft read back of a clearance or instruction is incorrect, the controller will transmit the word negative, followed by the correct version. And when an amendment is made to a clearance, the new clearance will be read back in full to the pilot and will automatically cancel any previous clearance. So you only go with what you've been given in the latest uh, bit of information. So critical information then. If we look at the critical information uh, that must be read back, this is really, really important. So it, it's critical information which must be received by pilots to ensure the safety and effective operation of their aircraft. Some examples that we put on the screen there of critical information, uh, such as low visibility procedures, wind shear warnings, essential aerodrome information, equipment serviceability that's going to affect the flight, like ILS or navigation aid serviceability. Uh, weather hazards which are considered to be a safety uh, issue as well, such as thunderstorms, hail or icing. All the pilots are, uh, are warned of those things via ATC. And in fact, um, some of those, the pilot can also tell ATC if they encounter them. So that's a bit from me. And uh, Matt is now going to carry on with some things to do with en route RT procedures. Over to Matt. Thanks very much, Nigel. So um, before we get into the detail on this next section, it's quite a short section. There's just some things we're going to highlight for you. Let's have a look at another poll. So let's put this up. So uh, and uh, I'm smiling as I say this because I, I noticed one of the, uh, the questions that has, uh, has already come in. But poll three, have a go at this. How will a controller say a Q&H of 1000? HPA. Is it answer A, 1000, pressure 1000, 1000 hexapascals, 1000 HPA. So, how do you think that's going to be transmitted by the controller? Have a look at those options there. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's have a look at the actual answer. And the correct answer is answer C, 1,000 hectopascals. There you go. So let's have a look. How do people get it? Look at that. It's quite a good response there, 1,000. And I can tell you now, uh, Nigel and I had a debate about this, didn't we, Nigel, when we were, <coughs> when we were prepping this as well? We did. This is, we did. This is the great thing about RT and this subject. It's huge, and there's lots of changes and things do change and do update and this was one of the things that has changed in recent years i can't remember exactly uh, why but it is um as answer c there so it has one of the things that has changed and updated uh, in all of the various procedures so let's move on to the next slide please so the vfr initial call so normally the initial call to an ats unit should only include the minimum information need to establish the service you require or the clearance information that you need. 
So here's some examples along the bottom there. Westby approach, golf, Alpha Bravo, Charlie Delta, request, and then type of service. So it might be request traffic service, request basic service. Or along with the next example there, you may be requesting to join, to join the airfield uh, on return. Or it may be on the ground. You may be requesting a taxi or similar things uh, like movements or a clearance or something like that. The tower ATC unit or whatever you're working should then respond with their call sign and pass your message. And then that's your prompt to then pass the full message relating to either the service or the routing or whatever it is you're trying to do. But this is one of the things that is really important. I can see some things popping in the chat box there of people reinforcing this as well. Um, this, this allows the, the controller to sequence the aircraft that they're managing on frequency so they can get back to people in the order that they need to do. But also if people kind of arrive on frequency and kind of splurge a lot of information, that's what can cause that RT congestion that Nigel was talking about earlier. So if you can keep this nice and slick, it allows the flow of information between you and the controller and the use of the frequency to be as effective and efficient as possible. This is also something, those of you that are students as well, uh, that you know, this is something that the examiner will look for in your flight tests and when you're doing your RT ground exams as well, it's something that the RT examiners are very much trying to look that students and trainees uh, get right to, uh, to help bring the RT standards up. This is for VFR, of course. The IFR initial call can be quite different. And if you want to read up on that, it's just have a look in uh, CAP 413, because it, the, the IFR initial calls can be quite different there as well. Let's move on to the next slide then, please. So position reporting as well. When providing a position report, you should include the information you can see on the screen now. So your aircraft identification is normally your call sign, your position. So it may be, for example, Golf, Alpha Bravo, Charlie Delta, mid channel, for example. The time in minutes, so e.g. 1.5 for minute 15. Your level, and whether that's if you're flying at a flight level, or a particular altitude that you're working. And the next position, i.e. where the next turning point is, and the ETA at that turning point. Now, this is, like I say, a very um, procedural position reporting point. If you're responding with a position report that a controller has asked you to report at a particular position or altitude, this wouldn't you wouldn't use this this full format as well. So, for example, if inbound a controller had asked you to report at a particular point, he might have said, you know, or she may have said, uh, report overhead this point VRP or a port report a beam, uh, whatever. In which case, you would then just go back with that short position report in accordance with what the controller has requested you to do. So these kind of full position reports, this is something you would typically maybe get uh, if you were flying uh, across the channel and you were working London information, for example. So that was a very, very quick look at a couple of en route things. I'd say en route and especially uh, air traffic services outside controlled airspace is a very, very big subject. Um, but those are just a couple of top tips uh, we were keen to give you from our discussions. So I'm going to hand back to Nigel and he's going to look at the equally vast subject of Aerodrome RT now. So over back to you, Nigel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's a bit of discussion going on in the chat box there, which is always good. Um, right, so uh, Aerodrome RT. So before we get into the detail on the section, let's have a, uh, a quick poll as always. So quick question for you then. So after your final call, the controller tells you to continue approach and that means you should do what fly go around or land when you can see the runway is clear repeat your final call with the intentions uh, or carry on flying approach but wait for your landing clearance and bear in mind that you'll only hear continue uh, continue approach 
from a full ATC airfield uh, controller, full ATC. So there are the options. Uh, quite a quick one, that one. So I don't think we need to waste too much time. So uh, the correct answer is you should carry on flying the approach, but wait for your landing clearance because the continue approach does not mean you are clear to land. And I'm glad to see that 96% of you got that right. So well done. So uh, we're pretty safe uh, in that bit. Right. So uh, let's have a look then at uh, continuing aerodrome RT. Uh, concise and un unambiguous phraseology used at the correct times is vital to the smooth, safe and expeditious running of an aerodrome and associated air traffic zone. So it's not only the means by which instructions and information are passed, but it also assists pilots in maintaining an awareness of other traffic in their vicinity. So don't forget, when you make you know, your calls, it's not just the controller that's hearing it, it's everybody else as well, which helps those everyone in the, you know, in the vicinity, their situation awareness is where everybody else is, especially in poor visibility conditions. So the type of service provided at an aerodrome falls into one of three categories. Um, in this section, the examples that we're going to use are used by air traffic controllers. But remember that there's this phraseology that's different used by FISOs, Flight Information Service Officers, uh, which are call signs which have got an information suffix, and air ground communication service operators who operate under a call sign of radio. So they're all different as to what they can and can't do. So we're going to cover taxiing, takeoff, the circuit and landing. So let's have a look at taxi instructions then. So taxi instructions issued by a controller will always contain a clearance limit as to where you've got to stop, which is the point at which um, unless further permission is given, you need to halt. OK. For departing aircraft, the clearance limit will normally be the holding point of the runway in question but it might be another position on the aerodrome, depending on the prevailing traffic, whether they've got instrument approaches going on and all sorts of things like that. Taxi clearances should, wherever possible, be noted down by the pilots, because sometimes you can get distracted and then you can't remember what you were supposed to do. So always write it down. So take off clearances then. So except in the case of emergency, messages will not be transmitted to an aircraft in the process of taking off or those aircraft which are in the final stages of an approach and landing. So when you're ready for departure, the telecontroller that you are ready for departure and you never, ever say ready for takeoff, the only time we use takeoff is when the clearance to do so has been given and issued and the pilot then acknowledges that clearance as in the example on the screen. So ready for departure and the controller then says cleared for takeoff and then you will reply with the words cleared for takeoff. They are the only times you ever say those words takeoff. Um, so that, as I said, came, comes from a, a big accident in Tenerife that happened with two 747s, uh, both taking off on the runway from opposite ends. Um, and uh, it's it's only ever it's really important that you only ever use the word departure unless you're replying to a takeoff clearance. So controllers use um, uh, the, the the phraseology that we've done on the see on the screen there because of of that possible ambiguity between departure and takeoff and things like that. So the surface wind will only be passed if there's a significant difference to that already uh, passed to you, uh, although in most cases you'll find that they issue the wind as a matter of course. A takeoff clearance shall be issued separately from any other clearance message. You'll never get uh, a cleared for takeoff along with some other things as well. So for traffic reasons, a controller may consider it necessary for an aircraft to take off without any delay, in which case you'll be given an instruction that goes something like cleared for immediate takeoff. And the pilot then is expected to, if you're at the holding point, taxi immediately onto the runway and commence the takeoff without stopping the airplane. Or if you're already lined up on the runway, don't forget, a line-up clearance is not a clearance to take off. You would line up and then you would wait. 
so if you're already on the runway, take off without delay. Um, and if you're unable to do an immediate takeoff, then you must, you must tell the controller that you're unable to do so. Okay. Um, let's have a look at the circuit position reports then. Um, so we all know how important circuit position reports are because whenever we say call a position, we ought to know whereabouts to be looking for that other traffic. So if you don't, uh, you know, if or if you call a position that isn't isn't uh, strictly in accordance with what we see on the screen here, then people are going to start looking for you in the wrong place, and it can cause a problem. And the same thing applies to all of those aircraft which are in the circuit, and also the situation awareness of aircraft which are joining as well. So, if you look at position one, then that's where you normally report downwind, okay? Is it is the upwind end of the runway, that's where you report downwind. You shouldn't report it before you get there, okay? Um, position two, if you reach the uh, uh, a beam, the landing threshold of the runway, then if you get past that point, that's called late downwind. Um, position three, uh, if you really want to, you can report base, um, if that's required by air traffic control, or I, I say if it's a really busy circuit to help everyone's situation and awareness as to where all the airplanes are. Uh, position four is final. It's not on final, and there's a reason for that, and that's to do with position five. Uh, position five, if you're between four and eight miles away from the threshold, that's called long final. And that's why you don't want to say the words on final for a normal final call, because it's so easy to miss here long and on. OK, and it is two very different places in the circuit. So. Um, if uh, if we if we get on to final, then so typically what happens is, is you go, say, Golf Charlie Delta final. And then the controller would say, Golf Charlie Delta, runway three, four, surface wind, two, seven, zero degrees, seven knots cleared to land. So out of that, you'd have to read back, runway three, four, cleared to land, Golf Charlie Delta. We don't need to read back the weather, the wind, in other words. If the runway is obstructed when the aircraft makes its final report at four miles or less from touchdown, but it's, it's but is expected to be available in good time for the aircraft to make a safe landing, on those occasions, the controller will delay the landing clearance. So sometimes you end up with uh, a conversation that goes something like Golf Charlie Delta final, and the controller says Golf Charlie Delta continue approach, wind 270 degrees, five knots. And then you would then reply with continue approach Golf Charlie Delta. So again, it's it's an indication to you that you continue the approach. We've had the question already, but it's not a clearance to land. So a controller may or may not explain why they didn't give you the landing clearance or why that clearance has been delayed. Um, but uh, it's as I said, it's not an invitation to land, and the pilot must await landing clearance. Or if you don't get one, you must go around. It's as simple as that. So let's have a look at going around then. Let's have a look at a missed approach. Um, OK, sorry, we've just skipped a slide there. That's why I just talked about my mistake. If we go on to the next one. So a missed approach. So instructions then uh, to carry out a missed approach may be given to avert an unsafe situation. Uh, when a missed approach is initiated, cockpit workload is usually high, and any transmissions to aircraft going around are usually kept brief and to a minimum. So if a controller wants you to go around, they would usually say something like, Golf, Charlie Delta, go around. I say again, go around, acknowledge, because they want you to acknowledge that you have heard them. And your reply would be, going around, Golf, Charlie Delta. Okay. Um, and the controller may acknowledge that if they want to, as we see on the screen there. If an aircraft on an instrument approach uh, is to carry out a published, uh, if it's on an instrument approach, it's to carry out a published missed approach procedure. An aircraft operating VFR usually continues into or back into the normal circuit traffic pattern. Okay, so you go back round and go crosswind and join downwind again. 
Okay. So, um, of course, uh, you can also opt to go around yourself, in which case you just call Golf Charlie Delta going around and uh, the controller will just acknowledge that anyway. So uh, let's have a look at runway vacating and communications after you have landed. So as we've said, usually controllers don't give you taxi instructions until the landing roll is complete or until they can see that the aircraft is safely under control at taxiing speed on the runway. Um, unless otherwise indicated, you, you don't change frequency by yourself at controlled airfields. You would remain on the frequency, typically the tar frequency, until the runway has been vacated. And then you would normally call Golf Charlie Delta runway vacated. And then you would receive further instructions such as uh, Golf Charlie Delta, give way to the Cherokee on Taxiway Alpha, taxi to the Flying Club, um, and then you would repeat back that uh, those instructions, okay, as you see on the screen there. So that's a, a, a very, very brief intro to RT terminology for aerodromes. So we're going to go back to Matt now, and he's going to give us some top tips on RT in general. Back to Matt. Thanks, uh, Nigel. Great stuff. So we've just got a few top tips and these are things to think about. Uh, we're not going to go over them all in detail, but these are maybe some things that you can take away and discuss amongst your flying friends or on a bad weather day, have a discussion about them or it might be something over a coffee in these uh, kind of foggy dark nights that you want to have a read up yourself in CAP 413 or uh, on the internet. So let's have a look at, the, if we could have the slide, please. So the Mayday call and the reason the content in is that order. Why don't you go up and have a read up on that as well. And incidentally, one of the things you might notice when you have a read up is that POB, persons on board, is only ever mentioned in a Mayday call now. No other call, unless it's, uh, like I say, a specific local procedure there as well. Call sign abbreviation. Uh, we've touched on it quite a little bit throughout this presentation. And in fact, I've noticed there's been some really good debate in the chat box and good questions about this as well. Um, knowing how many times and when to pass your full call sign or when to use the abbreviation and when a controller may or may not abbreviate uh, is, is a really good thing to understand. And it is something that is can be quite confusing as well actually and it does it um when you especially when you're learning it can be something that takes a little bit to get into that initial call uh, as well we we talked through some of the initial calls as well and have a think about how do you actually restart uh, a conversation there as well once you're actually on frequency there as well and for responding to traffic calls. This is something that um, is very commonly being discussed with examiners and uh, instructors on refresher flights now at the minute. And this is traffic calls for the um, air traffic services outside controlled airspace. So if you're working a, a traffic service, the options are now traffic in sight, traffic not sighted for those things. If you look in CAP 413, that was one of the things that again has come in over the last few years. And those are the, the correct responses uh, uh, to those uh, traffic calls from the controller to you as well. And what does standby actually mean? This is something that again can confuse people and can worry people if they're standing by. There's always that urge to, to fill silence or, or a gap. Have a read up what that actually is. Next slide, please. This is another good one to have a read up and refresh yourself as well on. What's the difference between free call and contact? And um, this is how, where you are either getting passed over or changed to an onward frequency or service or unit from somewhere you've actually been working. That's a good one to go and challenge yourself on to as well. And the difference between Roger and Wilco. What are those responding to? And what do those differences between them actually mean to the controller when you reply with those as well? Incidentally, I had a friend 
but had uh, had two dogs and they were called Roger, Roger and Wilco, his two dogs. He was going to get a third one uh, and called Mayday, but um, his, uh, his partner wouldn't let him get a third one. So he was stuck with Roger and Wilco for a while, but there we go. And how do you ask for something to be repeated? That's say again. And how is it if you got part of a message, but not all of a message? What would you like to say to the controller to get some of that as well? Incidentally, uh, some of you may not know this, but a lot of uh, radios actually have a play button now. Some of the trig systems and some other makes of radios have a little button that you can press and it will actually replay the last transmission that the controller made uh, in the actual RT unit. And that's a really, really good little feature as well that some of you may have on your radio sets and you didn't realise. And how do you correct a mistake? Correction is the terminology that we use. Have a read up on how you would do that. And rounding of altitudes. And remember what we're looking for there is it's all about rounding altitudes to the nearest 100 feet. Uh, so have a, have a look at those. Those are some things that you can um, uh, have a look at and like I say, have a chat about there as well. And I've seen a few questions coming in on some of that. I'll try and respond to some of those in the chat as we go into uh, some of the discussion. But um, thanks very much. I think back to you, Chris. Lovely job. <clears throat> thanks ever so much. Um, before we move on, um, just, it's worth pointing out that this uh, presentation and this uh, webinar is purely based on CAT413. Lots of debate in the chat box, and that's really good. Um, but if you really want, if you want to know what the actual things are, it's all cut 413. So it's well worth having a refresh on that. And in terms of getting up to date safety information, particularly for cap uh, refreshes and cap changes, um, it's well worth signing up to the CAA Skywise service. So that would, uh, that would highlight when the caps change and other various useful stuff on there. Speaking of the CAA, uh, they've just released a brand new safety sense leaflet on RT. So uh, Chloe's going to put that in the chat now and sorry, the chat box now. So you'll see that uh, pop in. That's really good. Um, and it's also that'll also come out in the links after the presentation as well. Another thing that's um, really good and really well worth uh, looking at is the Skyway code. So CAP 413, Skyway code, and the Safety Sense Leaf at RT, they're three good places to start uh, to knuckle down and get the uh, get the details of any RT, if there's any RT ambiguity that you still have out there. Because as the guys have mentioned, this is a pretty vast subject, right? And we're only just scratching the surface this evening. So there's lots of depth in those documents. Right, then let's talk about some questions then. So uh, we've had question one uh, sent in ahead of time from Jake, which is great. Thanks, Jake. Hopefully you're on this evening. Um, his question is, as far as he can see, and it isn't captain covered in CAP 413, it's what to say when, you, when he's passing close to or above an air to ground or information aerodrome. He's not intending to land, doesn't require a service, and he's staying clear of the ATZ, but he wants to let them know he's there. What phrasing would you use? Team? <laughs> I can have a go for like So go for it. obviously if it's, uh, it depends, oh, it says it's air ground. Uh, you said air ground, didn't you? So, um, so they can't give you any clearances or anything like that. They can't give you a basic service. Uh, so, what I would say, I would just give them a call and say, uh, I'd like any known traffic information uh, that might affect my flight to the west of your ATZ by three miles at altitude, whatever. And that's after, that's not on the first call, that's on the subsequent call after they've asked you to pass your message. So um, so at least you'll, you'll, you'll be getting the information about anything they might know about. And bear in mind what they might know about is going to be pretty limited because they won't have any assistance from radar or anything else. That's just their local knowledge as to what's going on in and around their circuit pattern. But more importantly, you've made the transmission. And going back to what we said about the situation of awareness, that everyone who is on frequency will have heard you and they now know where you are as well. So you've got lots of eyes looking out for you as well as your eyes looking out for other people. And I think, I think the key thing there as well is if you... Uh, say you're going to do something, uh, say you're, you know, routing, uh, you know, five, two nautical miles to the north at 2000 feet or whatever it happens to be, you then need to re try and actually do that and fly that profile because the other people on that frequency and around will have built their situation awareness and will be expecting you to do what you've said you've done. So um, if you are then going to modify things, 
or do something different, uh, you need to really update that ideally. Great, thank you. Okay, <laughs> this one's from Andy. Um, is the initial call when approaching inbound or request join? <laughs> um, in the latest version of the um, uh, CAT 413 and also the latest safety sense leaf that the CI have just issued, it's actually request join um, for anything, even for an air ground unit. It says that it's request join. Personally, uh, I don't mind inbound either. It's sort of the same thing. It's don't forget the initial call only. You're going to get told to pass your message where you're going to give a lot more information uh, and uh, about where you are and what you're doing. So, so long as the message is unambiguous, then I don't actually personally have a problem for either. But technically, it's request join. And I think, Nigel, that comes from the military phraseology, which has always been uh, request join. So I think that's part of the uh, standardisation, because if, if people don't, weren't already aware, um, the military uh, air publications uh, have all been uh, binned in terms of RT now, and the military and civilian uh, RT manuals are all CAT 413. Everything is standardised in that one CAT for both military and civil. And the idea was to try and bring some standardization and understanding between military and civil users in the UK. Good. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Nigel. OK, um, this one's from Ludwig. Uh, what's the best course of action if I'm given an instruction, for example, a route I have to take off and I'm a bit overwhelmed by it all? I haven't written it down uh, and I've forgotten what's been said. What do I do? Who's diving in on that one? What should you do? <laughs> what should you do? It's all gone. It's all gone. It's a clutter of bits after take off. What should you depends, do? It depends whether if you haven't written it down and do you now know not want to do before you take off, or do you know now what not want to do after you've departed? But either way, um, own up is, is is the answer. Don't try and make it up and busk it as you go. So uh, you know, be quite clear and say, uh, you know, things like uh uh, Golf Charlie Delta uh, request my initial route clearance uh, or request repeat initial route clearance. If you if you in a situation like that, if you're airborne, the chances are the controller is only going to give it to you a bit at a time because he knows you're overworked, he knows you're under pressure mm -hmm. because you've just taken off. So they're very you know control. The thing to remember is controllers are not gods. They are only there because you are in the air. They are your servants. They are there at your beck and call. Yes, they give you instructions to help make sure everybody keeps safe, but that's the important bit. You know, don't try and busk it. Don't try and fudge it. Just own up and say, you know, uh, if if all else fails, talk in plain English, say, I've forgotten my route clearance. Can you say again? Just like that. You know, it just safety is paramount. And one thing you can perhaps try and remember to write it down is so uh, Typically, IFR clearances follow the format of craft, which is clearance limit, the routing, the altitude, the departure frequency, and the transponder code. So craft. So you can get used to expecting it in that order. Now that's typically for IFR clearance routing departures, but many VFR clearances will also follow the same kind of format as well. So if you can get used to what format uh, you're expecting to hear things when you then do hear it and you're kind of scribbling it down on your knee pad um, if you know that format it makes it a lot easier to follow because you're kind of your brain's half expecting what it's going to hear and write down yeah controllers always give it in the same order or they should do put it that way there was another question on there about shorthand uh, mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. best shorthand you can find is one you invent yourself so try and invent your own. I mean, I've got my own. Like if I if it's a if it's a squawk, I'll put S followed by four digits. If it's a Q and H, I'll put H followed by four digits. Um, if it's a if it's a not above an altitude, I'll write down the figure and put a line above the numbers. Simple little things like that. Try and use graphics, not having to write out not above altitude because that would take too long. There's some good top tips in there. Thanks. OK, um, this probably is a question from earlier on, and I think we covered it, uh, from Godfrey. When calling final, shouldn't you state the runway? <laughs> um, uh, 
you don't have to no unless the uh unless you're at a controlled airfield and they've they've told you to report final runway two three uh, in which case you would for example but um you know the gen generally uh you know it final you you hopefully are in the right circuit pan anyway um I don't suppose there's any harm in saying what runway you're on, but again, it is, it's a close call between, you know, going into verbose mode again compared to uh, safety mode. If, if you're on an airfield where you've got multiple runways in use at the same time, then it's worth doing it from a safety perspective. But generally, if you're only on one runway, uh, I, I don't see the necessity unless uh, Matt disagrees. No, quite, quite agree, Nigel. And it's all about, I think it's it's what add value what what adds value isn't it in, with with your calls everything that you transmit should be adding value or it should be making that contract with the controller so you're you know you, you're making the controller understand that you've understood or are going to follow something really I think that's the, the kind of the rule with with everything that we're trying to transmit. Lovely job, thanks. Uh, let's talk about some en route stuff here then. This one's from Max. Does a basic service require regular position reports? We're both shaking our heads, so the answer's no. <laughs> this is the classic, ask two examiners, get two answers right. Good. <laughs> if, you right. Put, if you put 10 pilots in a room, you'll get 14 different opinions on RT. So, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Basic, right. basic service gives the most autonomy to the pilot there's no there's no requirement to give position reports at all unless the controller asks you to you don't have to tell him that you want to change heading height or altitude you know height heading altitude or, or whatever you can just do it on a basic service perfect thanks okay this one's from peter he says please could you cover land after <laughs> yes <laughs> okay Unless you want to do this, Matt, do you? I don't mind doing it if you want to. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give an intro spill and you can finish it. So an example might be, you know, um, big jet 347, runway 28, land after the Boeing 737, wind calm or whatever. The readback would be runway 28, land after the, the Boeing 737, big jet 347. That's the cap 413 phraseology. The key thing here is that you're acknowledging that it's a land after not just a cleared to land and you're also acknowledging the the type that you're landing after and the controller wants to know that so that they know that you've identified the right aircraft and you know what you're looking at effectively so um it, it's a it is a slightly different type of clearance yeah it's it's basically used a controller can only give you a clearance to land if the runway is completely unoccupied. So if an aircraft has landed ahead of you, uh, for example, uh, say, and he's right down at the far end of the runway, uh, the controller is able, they don't have to, is able to issue a land after clearance. And then it's down to you to decide that I can land and stop before I get to the other runway, sorry, the other aircraft at the far end. So it is a clearance to land, but they can't give that to you because they can't do that if there's more than one aircraft on the runway. So that's that's where the terminology comes from. But the onus is back on to you. You are allowed to land, providing you're happy that you're going to be able to stop before you hit the aeroplane at the other end. And I think I'm right in saying, Nigel, and I'm going out on the limb here because I've, I've, I've <laughs> literally said it here. It's if the preceding aircraft has landed and is in the process you know, is landed on runway and is vacating. They can't give you a clear to land after an aircraft that's performing a touch and go. I don't no. think. No, yeah. I, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Phew. <laughs> <Good stuff. laughs> we agree. Start <laughs> handing out your phone numbers for follow up questions. That's right. <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, okay. This is a good one. Again, let's just jump quickly back to basic service. This one's from Paul. He's in a basic service outside controlled airspace. Um, how does he ask or tell someone that he's changing frequency? <laughs> uh, okay, well, te technically, it depends who you're talking to. So if you're talking to a controller or an air traffic service unit, as opposed to a physio or air ground, then you need to request 
uh, I'm going to use my words carefully, you need to request the frequency change, but that's not what the call is. The call is request change to mm. what is your one, two, five decimal eight. So you request the change. When you're talking to air traffic controllers, it's a bit like having a Sunday dinner with the family. You have to ask to leave the table. OK, <laughs> <laughs> um, when, everyone's going to remember this now. When, when you're talking to uh, FISO or <laughs> uh, or air ground, technically, you don't have to ask to leave the table. You can just say that you're going to go. So you can say Golf Charlie Delta is changing frequency to uh, sorry, is changing to Watershed 125 decimal eight. In my book, I it, to save you having to remember all of that stuff, who you have to request it from and who you can just say you're going to go. Uh, I just say to people, rightly or wrongly, if you always request a, a change, then you're only going to be over polite to uh, the air ground and the info people. And you're never going to be wrong with air traffic control. Uh, but that's just my you know, easy way out of things. It's not strictly correct, but because you can't actually request anything from, you know, request permission to leave a frequency from air ground or FISOs. But uh, that's how you do it. You just request the change if it's full air traffic control. Remind me not to take my three year old to uh, Sunday lunch at Nigel's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, one, no one's doing that. Right. OK, uh, this one's for John. Um, he says he flies a motor glider, so he's slower than many in the circuit. He routinely calls ATC as motor glider, motor glider, Golf Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta. Is that good practice? Or should he just use his call sign? It, it, it is um, applicable to use um, prefixes. And again, I think it comes back to what we we're saying about is if it adds value. So if it gives other circuit traffic or the controller and awareness that you may be slower or flying a different profile um, that that's value added i would say and is worth doing um, you may have shared circuits with gyrocopters if any of you are out there with gyros they fly quite different uh, profiles very steep uh, ascents and descents and sometimes when you hear uh, gyro um, prefix with the call sign, I find that quite helpful actually, because I then know I'm looking for them in potentially quite a different place to a fixed wing potentially. Fair enough. Good stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a TCAS one, which is a goodie. Okay. Ooh. It's from John. Having been given traffic information, he sees it on his screen, ADSB, sorry, ADSB, not TCAS, apologies. Um, is there a phraseology to report that back to the controller that he's got it on ADSB? Uh, I can give you one answer because um, I was recently criticised in my central flying school uh, standardisation for doing this and told not to do it. So, um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you. So uh, that we had got a habit of saying, um, you know, um, traffic not sighted, held on TAS or seen on TCAS or something like that. Some pilots are doing that. And it was uh, an, a way of giving the controller a knowledge that, hey, we can't see them visually yet, but we kind of know where they are and we keep in clear of them because we can see them on our screen. Um, but we were told, uh, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, the response is either traffic in sight or traffic not sighted. I don't know what Nigel thinks about that. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I don't think the RT has quite caught up with um, ADSB uh, and the, you know, the, the, the moving map displays. I, I have heard an interesting term used where they said, I've got it on PCAS, personal collision avoidance system. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's a complete misnomer, I know. But I think, uh, yeah, Matt, I agree. I, I don't think we've quite caught up with it yet with RT as to the capabilities that some aircraft have in the GA world. Yeah. Okay, so we are running out of time. However, considering this quite a few questions, um, well, let's run for another five minutes, shall we? And get through this, because everyone seems to be enjoying it. <laughs> so another five minutes of questions. What have we got here then? So here we go it's from Jamie. Do you need to always notify when you're entering or leaving an ATZ? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to belt feed these questions now. Boom. Yes. <laughs> Next. Rule 11. Um, for passing information on a cross-country flight, is there a useful mnemonic you would advise using? This is from Anonymous. Um. Uh, lots of the monomics are now monomics used previously and are out of date with the new uh, CAP 413. For those of you that don't know, 
uh, it has changed as to the content of the subsequent message. In other words, the bit that you say after somebody says, pass your message, it is significantly different to what everybody currently uses based upon their, their learning, especially if you've had your PPL for quite some time. And I would suggest that, I'm not going to go into it here, but I would suggest that you go and have a good read of CAT 413 because it is very different to what it used to be. Yeah, true. I'm, in fact, to be fair, all three of us had to go and have a good read of that before this, didn't we? Because there was there were three different opinions going. Hang on, I mean, I didn't realise that changed. So yeah. yes, absolutely. Go back to what I said before: Skyway Code, Cat Four One Three, and the latest safety sense leaflet. If you read nothing else after this evening, go and have a gander through those. The latest okay. safety sense leaflet is a is a really good sort of read over. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Page. Yep, really good. It's good. Okay. Um, blah, 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 here we go. This is from David. Interesting one. How would a hot air balloon mm -hmm. make air traffic aware of their flight outside the ATZ without definitive control, control of heading? Hmm. Can't. Well, I always thought hot air balloons could control their heading. <laughs> so did I. Uh, according to what height they flew with the wind. But uh, yeah, I, I think by the virtue of the fact you're going to call yourself a hot air balloon in your call sign probably gives the game away to a certain extent. But mm. over to Matt. So I, I think it's the same same as the gliders and the glider community have got lots of experience of this actually and I think they will it's it's our like our example earlier when we talked about passing close to an ATZ I think the the gliders and the balloon people will call up and let the uh, controller uh, know what where they are roughly and what they intend doing and we often uh, hear them at Bryce Norton here above where I'm sat right now um, gliders will call up heading over the zone and the controller will sometimes say to them if you intend to descend below 4,000 feet can you recall or something like that so often that's that's what happens so if the glider uh, starts losing lift and starts descending the controller uh, has said to them and it's not a it's not a clearance because they're in class g outside the zone but it's just a, a friendly request to say, look, if you're going to start descending because you're losing lift, let me know so we can sort it out for you. And uh, I hear that quite often and it works very well. And the glider community uh, uh, engage really, really well with that. And I know the BGA have done a, a lot of work uh, on that as well, which I think has been very successful in that community. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, there's a couple of questions regarding the most up-to-date version of CAT 413. That will get sent to you after this in the email. Uh, so don't worry about finding that. I know people have been Googling it and finding old versions. We will send you the most up to date one. Uh, where are we? So this one's from Jim. Uh, when requesting join, can you give position and altitude in the initial call? No. <laughs> well, I, I say no. According to what I've run in CAT 413, usually yeah. you don't. It's, it's just say request join. Then you get asked, pass your information. And in the subsequent call is when you then give that information out. But I'll be led by the wise. No, I, I believe it's the case of is what will happen is when you make that initial call, the controller may be generating a strip for you, uh, whether it be a physical one or an electronic strip, potentially. And then then they may say pass your message. They're then ready to take down the, the relevant details to sequence it in their system. Lovely job. Thank you. And the final question before we wrap from Ashley. Should you always ask for a traffic service over a basic service if possible? He's obviously not a controller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to, I, I think the, my, my quick answer to that is you need to think carefully about why you are asking for what you're asking. Don't forget a traffic service that a controller has to give you is much more onerous than a basic service. So if you've got a nice clear gin day and everybody asks a controller for a traffic service, he is or they are unable to service as many aircraft uh, as they would be able to. So I think the answer is yes, use it where you need to. If you're going down the middle of Mig Alley, you know, in a in a small gap where you know there's lots of aeroplanes, that's fine. Or if it's or if the weather is a bit iffy, but Try to give the controllers, you know, a bit of a break to allow them to offer their services to more people if necessary. That's my view anyway. And yeah, and to add to that as well, uh, a lot of ATC units may only be able to work four or five aircraft on a traffic service, typically yeah. uh, one controller. So that 
that, that can quite easily get. If you're working Oxford, for example, in the area around here as well, um, especially if they're also trying to take a biz jet through the same airspace on a deconfliction service, it can get really, really very busy uh, for the controller there as well. But however, having said that, don't forget, uh, you don't have to be on just a static routing uh, to request and accept a basic service, uh, a traffic service. Uh, you can accept a traffic service in a block. So if you're instructing or doing general handling, you can say, I'm going to be working in the block 2,000 to 4,000 feet and, and take a traffic service like that. You don't have to be on a, a set altitude heading at all. Um, so don't, um, if you feel you need a traffic service, don't be afraid of asking for one and, uh, and setting up that contract with a controller. Perfect. Thanks ever so much. Right then, we're going to wrap on that. So thanks ever so much. We have had lots of people turn up this evening from the length and breadth of the UK, uh, some as far afield as Barbados, which has been brilliant. <laughs> uh, we have hope you've been able to take something away from this. And as a reminder, if there's anything like you should, you'd like to revisit, the replay of the workshop will be sent to you via email. It'll also be available on the website. And there's also going to be a list of resources that will be sent to you as well. Uh, there will be a survey that pops up once we finish. So I'd love it if you would fill that in. Please tell us where we're going wrong. Please tell us what you'd like to see more of. Uh, please rate this presentation. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Again, just to push please do sign up to Skywise for CAP updates. We have run out of time. We've gone slightly over due to the uh, excellent questions we posed this evening, but I do uh, have really enjoyed it. I think the other the guys really enjoyed it as well. Uh, so thanks to the team. Thank you to Matt, Nigel and Chloe behind the scenes uh, for all of your participation, uh, all of your uh, rich knowledge and support. And thank you also to all the participants. So hope to see you again soon. Uh, that's enough from us. Thank you very much. Take care, stay flying. Bye-bye.